Well, today I'm excited to continue our series on the lost world of Adam and Eve in which we're uh, going through the book of Genesis and reminding ourselves that everything that God created was very good. And then man, whom he created to join with him in cultivating the earth and bringing order and bringing goodness to the earth, uh, when they took uh, the, the lordship into their own hands and decided to play God, that's where it all went really bad. And we've been discovering through Genesis how God in his goodness has been working ever since to restore and redeem his image on the earth and bring fellowship back between man and God and bring that goodness back again. I want to tell you the story uh, this morning about Kurt Bennett, who was a man lost and desperate for hope. He's not a Christian man, but desperate times call for desperate measures, and you start calling out to God just in case he happens to be there. Amen? Have you been there? So Kurt Bennett, in his own words, said he how, talked about how he walked alone into the woods of the Rogue Valley in Oregon, and he was there to pray, though he wasn't a Christian. And he was making that hike and praying like that fairly often because Kathy, his wife, was eight months pregnant with their first son, Gabe, and they were living in an 8 by 24 trailer, borrowing uh, that from his parents to make the rent because he didn't have a job. And the shower was so small, he described that Kathy, uh, being as pregnant as she was, she couldn't even pick up the bar of soap if she dropped it, and he was desperate for God to provide. And he said, I kept asking for the same two things on these walks into the woods. He said, God, if you're there, would you give me a job and would you bring some Christian friends into my life to teach me about who you are? And in his own words, he said, and what God did in response to that, I could hardly believe. It wasn't long after he started making these walks with these two specific requests that a firefighter job opened up in Medford and he applied. And he says, I had absolutely no education or experience with firefighting. But they gave us a book to study uh, to prepare for a test. And when I walked into North Medford High School cafeteria where the test was being administered, I couldn't believe what I saw. There was 300 people there to apply for this one job position. He almost turned around and walked out, but he thought, you know what? I've been up all night studying. I might as well go ahead and take the test. Who knows what might happen? As he sat down, he overheard two other fighter fighter candidates talking about a firefighter who had come from Portland to take the test and a fire captain from Phoenix who came up to take the test and his heart hit the floor. There was no way he could compete, but somehow he came out near enough the top to go ahead and get a follow-up interview. And somehow after the interview, they hired him. And somehow after they hired him, they put him on a crew full of Christians. One of the first things that crew did was invite them into a Bible study. And they held it every evening in the station dorm. And he said, mind blown. I worked for that fire department for 30 years. And those crew members became brothers. They gave me a Bible. They forced me to church. And I gave my life to Christ. Kurt, in his desperate time, not knowing anything about Christianity, thought, you know, before I go to pray in the woods, I, I ought to educate myself about, like, what should I talk about? Like, how do I talk to a God I don't even believe in? So he picked up a book by Ray Steadman with the question, why pray? And he took away two points before walking into the woods. Number one, the key to successful prayer, according to Jesus, is persistence. And he got that from Luke 18, parable of the unjust judge with a woman who had no standing before the judge, but she just annoyed the judge so much that he finally gave in to her persistence for justice. And so he said, well, I guess I'll just persist in what I want God to give me. And secondly, he learned from Ray Steadman's book, Why Pray, from Matthew 6, when Jesus said, when you pray, pray privately, and you don't have to use a lot of words to get my attention. Just be concise in what you want. And so he said, okay, I'm going to go to the woods persistently, and I'm going to ask for these two things. And wouldn't you know, God provided. God was faithful. Well, as we read together today in Genesis 25, I hope you're once again reminded 
of God's desire to use challenging times in our lives, as he used in Kurt Bennett's life, to bring us into full experiences of his grace that we would otherwise miss. That God's greatest desire for us is not success as we would measure it in easy times like we would all want, but intimacy with his children. Intimate knowledge of his goodness as we've been singing about. And nothing brings us into greater dependence and awe than we walk into circumstances we can't control and that are beyond us. And so I've titled today's message simply, God is Faithful. Read with me in Genesis 25 now, verses 21 through 34, where we're going to see that God has always been faithful as he was to Kurt, to those who call upon the name of the Lord. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So actually in the Hebrew, what she says, If this is how it's going to be, Lord, just kill me. (laughs) Have you been there? (laughs) The blessing became a curse real quick. And so what did she do? She went to inquire of the Lord. Lord, what's going on? And the Lord said to her, there are two nations in your room, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau, Edom, and his name means Harry. What a name. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to his heel. And so his name was called Jacob, heel catcher or supplanter. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Now that'll get you praying, won't it, right there. Whoo, 60 years old, poor, poor guy. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And he said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff over there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? And he said, Jacob then said to him, Swear to me that you're going to sell me this birthright. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Isn't it interesting that just as God challenged Abraham and Sarah's faith, By giving Sarah a barren womb, though he had promised them a lineage and a son that would bless all the nations, in the same way upon providing for them Isaac, Rebekah also has a barren womb. And what was the effect of the fact that God didn't allow it to come easy as you would expect of a promise of God? It causes Isaac to seek him in prayer for her barren womb. And what was the result in verse 21? The Lord answered and Rebekah conceived. And what was the point? God is working in our circumstances, as I said up front, to create intimacy and trust between us. I put on the overhead for you. If God is going to come out of an abstract distance in our lives where we just kind of assume he's there and, yeah, I believe in God. If he's going to come out of an abstract distance into a personal proximity, we must seek Christ with specific prayer based on his word. And one of the things I've learned to love about God is how every blessing he pours down in our lives, it really has built-in challenges and strife to keep us from growing autonomous from him after we've received it. Have you noticed that about your life? I uh, was recently talking to another pastor who told me how he's so excited about taking on a bigger church. 
you know, you, you kind of measure your success in numbers, and so it's like this great honor. They come to you, you're running 100, they say, we want you to take over our church of three, 400 people. You're like, whoo, feels good. And he was talking about that within about a month of going there, the thrill of the numbers wore off, and now he found he just had more problems. <laughs> Here he'd been praying for a bigger church, and God answered that prayer, and he felt so blessed, and then within a month, he was like, wait a second. This blessing has turned into strife for me and challenges I didn't foresee. I've talked to people who counted themselves blessed to come into a lot of money, only to find more money, more problems. Dream blessing, and you're going, man, I've made it, and life is going to be good and comfortable and easy, and I can just lay back and relax. And then you find, man, there's people coming out of the woods everywhere. All of a sudden, that's your cousin you didn't even know you had wanting your money. And you're feeling guilty every time the church asks for a fundraiser because they're kind of staring at you. The pastor's staring at you the whole time, talking about the fundraiser coming up. Hint, hint over here. No, I just want to make sure you're awake. I Here's the application I want us to see right up front. If we don't learn to continually walk with God, we won't enjoy the process. All of us are, we're looking for the next blessing that God's going to provide, and that's good. And God wants to bring more responsibility and influence and, and promotion to our lives. But we have to understand that he's never going to give us something that's going to cause us to go, you know what, I don't need you anymore, God, thanks a lot. And if we're not careful, we're always going to be looking for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And we think, well, if I could just get more money, if I could just get the promotion, if I could just get that next job, then I'll be happy and then I'll feel blessed and that'll be enough, God, I promise. And then you'll get there and you'll be blessed for about a month or two and then you'll realize, man, there's more to this than I ever realized. And now I got more of the same problems. The same in your marriage, your career, Change in churches. How many people I've talked to came in talking about their last church, and they're like, this church is so much better. And then I'll, I just know in six months they're going to find all of our weaknesses. <laughs> if we're not careful, just jump from thing to thing to thing and never allow the, the circumstances of our life to drive us continually deeper into intimacy with him, to grow our character. So Rebecca, she's desperately wanting to get pregnant, and then she gets pregnant and isn't long before there's unforeseen challenges with the blessing, and she says, I just want to die. And we see this with Abraham, we see this with Moses. With every call and promotion comes unforeseen challenges where you think, God, if you're in this, surely it shouldn't be so hard and so much strife and so many challenges. Do you still love me? I thought I heard from you. I thought I had the call, but now I'm questioning it because it's so hard. And I want to remind us, it's God saying, just keep coming back. I want you to go deeper and deeper and deeper with me. And when we begin to understand that God wants us to participate with him continually, we learn to rest in our challenges and in our problems, and see his hand at work and say, you know what, I don't got this, but God's got this. He hasn't led me here without seeing me through. He's going to teach me new things through these circumstances. You know, I was sitting on the porch the other day. How many guys have the Holy Spirit work through your wife continually? You ever have that? Yeah. Doesn't that drive you nuts that the Lord uses your wife to set you straight so much? And I was whining to her about COVID-19 and and she said, you know what, Ben, I've just decided I'm going to start looking at this as saying, you know what, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? I, I, you know what, I, I'm realizing then God is going to teach me a new level of patience and self-control like I never had for anybody who sees things different from me. I thought, why would you have to go say that and wreck all my fun? Felt so good to vent, and now you're convicting me. I'm the preacher here, let me preach, okay? Well, (laughs) 
What was the revelation that God gave Rebecca upon her seeking him? He said, listen, I'm doing something you, you just can't even believe I'm doing. <laughs> it's hard. And it's strife. But man, I got, some, I got a bigger picture in mind than you could. It would blow your mind what I'm in process with. And every time you're tempted, you see, to give and throw in the towel, what if God is shaping you and preparing your character for the next thing that would just blow your mind if you knew? And you're trying to exit. You're, you're trying to find the exit strategy. And God's saying, if you'll just hang in there with me and you'll keep participating with me, even when you don't understand and it's hard, I can use this for something that will blow your mind. I believe God is using circumstances in your life and circumstances in this nation to blow our minds. If the church will hang in there with him and participate with him and not hit the eject button, I think God's going to do something great through the circumstances of our lives. It's important that we understand that in this culture, and I put this on the over the end, the firstborn was entitled to a double portion of his father's possessions. Twice as much as any other son might inherit. He also became the family head. And this was known as the birthright. And so it would have been so strange that, wait, the older is going to serve the younger? Why is that? That God would reverse the normal order of the birthright between Jacob and Esau. Well, I believe it's because what we see in verse 34, God foreknew that Esau would despise his birthright. His action showed he considered his birthright worthless and that he, he showed disrespect for his position. He took it lightly. He didn't recognize the gift that it was. It's like somebody being born into a lot of wealth. And, and the danger of that, of course, is that you just take for granted what's handed to you. Or somebody that's born with a lot of natural gifts and graces where everything comes so easy to them that they never have to really work that hard. And in the end, it almost becomes a curse in disguise because they never have to develop character because it just is so easy. Here's Esau taking lightly this tremendous position that, he could, have, that could have been his. And we see this principle carried over into the New Testament when it comes to our own walk with God. John the Baptist tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to him for baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. He says, you know what? You need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance and not suppose that you can say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham for our father, and therefore we have God's blessing automatically, and we can just live however we want to live and do whatever we want to do. Do you think there's anybody today that just says, you know what? I believe God is there. And, you know, because of that, I believe I'm a Christian. But maybe takes it a little too lightly, Jesus saying, come follow me. And they're just going to live how they want to live and do what they want to do because they assume upon the grace of God because, hey, we, you know, we believe and we go to church once a month and we give when it's convenient. So, you know. And John is warning us early on in the Gospels. He's saying, don't suppose that you say to yourselves, well, we believe, and therefore, he says, you need to bear fruit with repentance and show that you truly want to follow Jesus by your lifestyle choices, by cutting sin out, by getting accountability. Jesus would then later say in John 8, 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, that you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They just assumed because they were Abraham's descendants and they were very religious people that God must be very pleased with them. And so they were just living however they wanted. They weren't taking the word seriously. And Jesus says, the problem is, yeah, you come to church every week, but you don't want to submit to my lordship. You don't want to follow me. You don't want to honor me. And it's not good enough that you just show up. In the same way Esau... He's just taking for granted his position. He's not taking it seriously. He's not understanding the value of what he's been handed and called to. And so he begins to just live for the here and now, the instant gratification. My, my daughter works at Little Caesars, and I just love the hot and ready, right? 
fast food. It's like, man, the second I'm hungry, and I can just run down the street. In fact, you know, Eddie even just bikes to work. I mean, she's right across the street, and I get a family discount. It's already just five bucks. And you really got to pray for my daughter. She's like hooked on the cheesy bread, and it, it's a problem. It really is a problem. Instant gratification, the here and now. And losing sight of the big picture ramifications that, you know, Eddie, if you don't che- slow down on that cheesy bread, you know, when you're 50, <laughs> I'm being a little silly, but, but in all honesty, in our own lives, in our walk with God, do we get a little flippant about the birthright he died to give us, the inheritance to come? the calling in our lives, the privilege to take on his name and represent his name? Do we forget that the first line of how he taught us to pray is, Father, sanctify your name. Make your name great. God, my, my heart's desire, my first priority in prayer is I want your name to be reflected well. And I don't want to do anything in my life that's going to misrepresent you. Do we presume on the grace of God, indulging in gossip and slander without a second thought? You see, Jacob, while his behavior certainly wouldn't have been condoned by God, at least he, he cherished the position. He cherished the privileges, and he was willing to work to find any way possible to take hold of that birthright. <laughs> And I want to ask us a probing question today. Are we more like Jacob or Esau in this story? Where we go, man, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to take hold of the birthright of Christ and all of its privileges. And I don't want to do anything in my life that's going to compromise the privileges of intimacy with Christ and the fullness of God in my life and the fullness of the inheritance to come. I don't want just the pearly gates to hopefully slap me on the butt and I can just slip in. I want to know Christ and the fullness thereof. And I count the things of this world as rubbish compared to knowing Christ who died for me and gave his all for me. Oh, it's so hard in a world like ours where we have so much privilege that we really do. And I don't mean that by the color of our skin. I mean that by the great wealth that we have in this nation. We're so spoiled and we have so much stuff. And if we're not careful, we can think that the stuff is more important than the one who created the stuff. And I want to be clear, there is nothing wrong with money If it's done right, if it's made right, money can be a great blessing in the hands of God, but it can also become a stumbling block when we allow it to break intimacy with our Father in heaven and we replace the the giver with the stuff. We become like Esau and we become a little bit indifferent and presume upon the grace of God because we're more concerned with our financial status and popularity in this world than the God who made it and the world to come that's going to last forever. Whose status are you more concerned with, your status with God or your status with the people of this world? Are you continually following God's grace in a proactive way of prayer as Kurt Bennett, as Isaac and Rebecca in this story? You say, God, I I almost thank you for any circumstances that remind me how much I need you. You know, I don't know what what God is doing right now through COVID-19. I really don't. I I think it's dangerous to presume and say, well, we know God's doing this right now. But I do know this. God wants to use this to get our attention say, you need me. Don't forget you need me. (laughs) Let me remind us church, that we were in the most prosperous time in our nation's history, and boom, overnight, shut down, gone. I mean, it was like, how is this? And I don't know about you, but that's a good reminder to say, don't put your trust in the things of this world. (laughs) Don't forget about me. Don't forget that tomorrow you might not wake up. 
And are you going to have a clear conscience that you've made the most of your time and spent it well in intimacy with me and following my leadership in your life? Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's everybody's birthright. That's what he wants for every single person. And my question is, are you delaying taking hold of it because you're too consumed with what you might have to give up to get it? We read in Hebrews 12, 15 through 17, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. We sang in our worship about how every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And we also hear from Jesus in that time, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is that weeping and gnashing of teeth? It's the recognition. I missed it. I missed the purpose and the point of my existence to have intimacy with my creator, God, who loves me, who died for me, who wants to be reconciled with me, who wants to set me free from sin and the fear of death and give me hope of eternal life regardless of what's happening in this life. The God who's using all of our circumstances right now to drive us into intimacy. I love how C.S. Lewis said it. He said, pain is God's megaphone in our life to say, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and trades the inheritance to come for the immediate gratification of the base desires of the flesh. We read in our call to worship today, I'm sorry, in our responsive reading today, those who live by the Spirit set their minds on what the Spirit desires. Those who live by the flesh, they're consumed with what the flesh desires. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires by the Spirit of God at work within them they might not be disqualified from the inheritance to come because one day there's going to be people seeking with tears and it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. You know the music lyric? Don't it always seem to go? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. We see in Esau someone who wanted the blessing once he realized he had lost it. However, he never acknowledged his sin of indifference. He comforted himself with the idea of murdering his brother for taking advantage of his weak estate. And in the end, when Jesus returns, we need to recognize and understand anyone who becomes indifferent like Esau to their birthright that he died to give you and lives for the lust of the flesh will also cry at their loss of blessing, but it will be too late. Seek me while I be, may be found. Call upon me while I am near. Take hold of it today. Jesus doesn't want anyone to perish. He cries over his people, says, Oh, how I long to take you under my wings, but you wouldn't have it. It's not his will. It's your will. Only two types of people in closing. Those who say, not my will, but your will be done. And those to whom God will say, okay, have it your way. Your will be done. And he says it with tears and anguish. And I believe it won't just be weeping and gnashing of teeth for people. But God weeps. And he says, church, in this in-between time, be careful not to slip into the indifference of Esau and harden your heart with sin. Be careful not to presume upon the grace of God. Be careful that you're putting the parameters and boundaries in your life of the church and Christian fellowship and prayer and personal devotions 
It will keep you on the straight and narrow path because broad is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Don't trade in eternity for the lust of the flesh here and now. Has any, any suffering now that we have to do in the flesh to say yes to Jesus, it pales in comparison to the glory to come Oh, Heavenly Father, we need you so bad today. We need you so bad, Lord. Oh, to awaken the hearts and minds of all of us to the reality of eternity and eternal things. We are so weak and susceptible to just the here and now and the lusts of the flesh and the impulses of the flesh and taking shortcuts whenever it's convenient and, and finding ways to justify it and make excuses for it. And not seeing that the problems and the circumstances are like they're a gift in disguise to draw us to you. To see that you are faithful and you will bless us. And you will continually put circumstances around us that will keep us close in participating in the life of God. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to make every effort to put on the armor of God daily, to put on the mind of Christ, that you'll help us to make every single effort to daily come and call upon your name with faith and knowing that your grace is sufficient for our every need, that everything that pertains to life and godliness is yes and amen in Jesus' name. That no temptation has seized us except for what's common to man. And you are faithful. You'll always give us a way out. And that the same resurrection power that rose Jesus from the grave is now ours to overcome the lust of the flesh. And so, God, I pray you'll help us as your people to make sure that nobody misses and falls short of the grace of God made available to them. That you'll help us all, Lord, to take hold of the birthright you died to give. And Lord, it's so hard sometimes because we know it's ahead of us. And, and sometimes right now it gets so hard and we want to almost soothe and medicate the, ourselves with fleshly things that are unhealthy that lead to death. But God, I pray that you'll set us free from short-sightedness. And that you'll help us keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter who will see us through to the end. You be the glory now and forever. Amen.